This is the latest prototype of my 8-bit computer. But before entering into details, let's rewind a bit to see how I reached this point. It all started a few months ago, at the beginning of this year. I was browsing some online shopping websites and I came across the Z80 CPU. Surprisingly, this CPU from the late 70s is still sold today. Then it reminded me the kid I was. In fact, my first gaming console was the Game Boy Color, and its processor was very similar to the Z80. This is when I started being fascinated by this processor. It was running my favorite games. Later, I learned that some older computers were made out of this processor, such as the ZX Spectrum or the Amstrad CPC. Getting to know these devices, I fell in love with their simplicity. In fact, today's computers are exponentially more complex than the 8-bit computers. For these reasons, I wanted to make a computer the young me would have loved to have. To do so, I need a direction, a goal for this project. So the computer I would like to make would be simple to understand and to use. Simplicity will be the keyword across the whole project. It would be programmable. Turn on, program, execute, play. Not only games, but also graphical softwares. It would support assembly and higher level programming languages. It would have graphics, as this is a must, but having sound will also be a very nice addition. It would be hackable. It would be made out of new discrete parts, entirely from scratch. It would not be an emulator and it will not be powered by a microcontroller. It would be easy to upgrade, so I would like to use deep packages with sockets whenever possible. It would also be very easy to extend with external modules such as ROM, RAM, joysticks or any other board that can be connected to the cartridge port. After spending some time looking for parts, reading the datasheets, checking the timings, I decided to start with the following components. A Z80 CPU, of course, which will be running at 10 MHz. A Z80 PIO for the inputs and outputs. A RAM of 512 kilobytes a ROM of 256 kilobytes, and finally some 7400 logic chips. So these are the components I decided to start with. Of course, they may change in the future. As I just said, we have ROM and RAM. Let's see how we can organize the memory. So the memory mapping is as followed. First, we have 8 kilobytes of fixed ROM, so non-banked. Then we have three ROM banks of 8 kilobytes each. On the RAM part, we have two 16 kilobytes area. The first one is banked, the second one is fixed. This last one will mainly be used by the system and the stack. A bank of memory can be seen as a window on our ROM or RAM. This means that at a single time, we can only see a part of the RAM or the ROM, depending on how we configure the window. My first reflex was to bring my breadboard, start plugging the CPU, the cables, the logic analyzer, and it was already a mess. Not only the amount of cables made it hard to understand, but the CPU was also generating some very weird signals. While testing it, I hardcoded the out instruction D3. What should have happened is that the CPU would activate the IO rake line by setting it to low. In my case, the logic analyzer showed that this line was never going low, it was always high. Something was definitely wrong. The problem could be anything. Bad cables, bad connections, bad breadboards. Well, in order to reduce the number of failures, I decided to open KiCad and start designing my first PCB. It would have the CPU, of course, the ROM without banking, the RAM with banking, some LEDs for having a feedback from the board, and a debug port which gives access to the whole bus. It took me two weeks to design the whole PCB. Then I placed the order to a PCB manufacturer in China. Meanwhile, I wrote the software example that I will run on it. It would simply turn on the LEDs one after the other, thanks to the out instruction. So the IO rec line must be working properly. A few days later, the board finally arrived. After soldering the components, including some sockets, it was time to test it again. I flashed the LED example on the ROM, plugged it into the socket, and nothing, still. The IO rec line was still high, no matter what. Last thing I could try was to replace the CPU. So I ordered a new one, waited a few days again, unpacked it, plugged it in, turned on the board, and... It worked, finally! Lesson learned, always buy several copies of the same component when placing an order. 
the first prototype working, it was time to start developing the next features. To do so, without having to go through the whole PCB making process, I soldered some handmade PCBs for each feature I wanted to test. It includes level shifters and PS2 keyboard modules. I was able to plug these modules directly on the debug board I had on the prototype. As I said earlier, one of the most important modules for the 8-bit computer I wanted is the graphic chip. Unfortunately, these chips are not made anymore. Of course, it would have been possible to use a refurbished one, but I would prefer to stick with new parts or parts which have a possible out-of-the-shelf alternative. As I'm also familiar with Viverlog on FPGA, I decided to use an FPGA for VGA graphics. Currently, the implementation I've made supports text mode and graphic mode. For the text mode, two resolutions are possible, 800 by 600 and 640 by 480. For the graphic mode, only 640 by 480 is supported. So this is not definitive, as the 800-600 resolution support may be dropped in the future. Let's get back to the memory mapping I showed earlier. We can see that we have no space left, half is taken by the ROM, the other half is taken by the RAM. However, the second half of the memory is read-write, because we will need to read and write from and to the RAM, but the first half of the memory does not have this requirement. We cannot write to the ROM directly from the board itself. So this part of the memory is read-only. But what does it mean? It means that, for writing, we have a 32k slot available. And this is what we are going to use to communicate with the FPGA. Some will ask, but wait, if we read from zero, we will get the ROM content. And indeed, when reading from the first 32 kilobyte, we will get ROM data. In fact, the video RAM, FPGA in that case, cannot be read back. But this is not a real issue. In fact, even though video RAM is usually read-write on some other platforms, it should not be assumed that it can be used as regular RAM. Moreover, as I stated at first, simplicity is the keyword. These 32 kilobytes are enough to map the whole video RAM in both graphic mode and text mode. So we don't need to perform any memory banking, unlike for the ROM and the RAM. Let's see an example to show the simplicity of this design. The 640x480 resolution text mode allows a maximum of 80x40 characters, which is 3200, or C80 in hex. So, in order to write the capital letter A, 65 in ASCII, on the top left screen, we simply need to write 65 at the address location 0. In Z80 assembly, it will look like this. We first load 65 in A register, and then we load this register to the memory address 0. Similarly, if we want to show the character B, 66 in ASCII, on the bottom right corner, we simply need to write 66 at the last screen address, which is C7F in hex. So, in the 80 assembly, it will look like this. First load 66 in A, and then load this register into C7F memory address. Right after getting the PS2 adapter and the FPGA VGA output working, it was time to start a more advanced prototype. Three weeks of work later, it was finally here. Larger than before, but with more features. ROM banking, integrated PS2 connector, Z80 PIO level shifters, and even more connector and more 7400 logic chips. After soldering, it was time to connect it to the FPGA and to see the common prompt appearing. I will not enter into details for this part of the video, else it will be much longer. This may be the subject of another possible video, depending on the feedbacks I will get. This is the point I reached until now. Regarding the upcoming improvements, the latest prototype does have some bugs. It can also be highly improved. Improving it will save some PIO pins, some chips, and also reduce the final cost of the board. Regarding the FPGA, I would like to get rid of the development board I'm using and make my own custom board. There are currently no persistent storage on the prototype board. In the future, I would like to add microSD support managed by the FPGA. For now, I have written a software I2C driver which lets me communicate with an EEPROM. So this gives us a 32 kilobyte of non-volatile memory available for saving data. I plan on integrating this chip on the next prototype. Finally, about the sound, we have the same problem like the video chips. They are barely used now, and so not manufactured anymore. I will use the FPGA for that purpose. As a proof of concept, I created the small sound module that sits beside the video module on the FPGA. It has two voices, both can output triangle, sawtooth, and square waves at any frequency between 20Hz and more than 20kHz. 
It's required, however, to have one RC filter per voice on the output. A demo is better than a thousand words. Okay, so here is a small demo to see what the board is capable of. So just below the screen we have the FPGA, uh, which is responsible for outputting a VGA signal and also the sound. So at the moment I only plugged one voice for the sound. Um, here we have the board itself, so with the CPU and the ROM and the PIO and the PS2 port uh, for the keyboard, which is here. And so let's see what we can do with this. Okay, so the OS has been written in assembly, uh, the AT assembly, and it's based around commands. So at the moment, the commands I've implemented are write mem for writing to memory location, read mem for reading from a mem memory location, uh, out IO to output a byte on the IO port, on the IO bus, sorry, and in IO for getting a byte from the IO bus. There is also exec to execute from to execute code from uh, a memory address that we can provide here, 4000 for example, and finally reset, to reset the board. So let's see a small example for the text mode. So if we would like to replace the word ready, which is at the first line, we can use write mem address zero, so which is the top left, uh, uh, top left of the screen, and let's see 65 for character A, and then 66, 67, 68 will replace the first four letter. And we can see ABC. Of course, we can do this for the following lines. So we have 80 characters per line. So if we write to address 80 and character, uh, let's say 69, 70, 71, it replaces the first three letter. Okay, so now let's see the graphics. So I've written a small demo which uses 60 different tiles and uh, they are shown multiple times on the screen and that's it. It's a bit... okay, okay, now it's better. So this looks like a, a map for a game, so so we have 60 different tiles here, and we can go up to 128 tiles. Uh, each of them are 16 by 16 pixels, and we have 40 by 30 tiles in total on screen. This example also embeds a sound, so only one voice is used at the moment, and only square waves are uh, used also, but the FPGA is already capable of outputting triangle waves and so tooth. So let's see, let's plug this uh, speaker, which is wired with a 3.5 jack. Let's plug it to the sound card. Don't know if the volume is high enough. Alright, so that's it for the moment. So we have graphics, we have text mode, and uh, more are coming, so stay tuned. Oh, I almost forgot, I named this project the Zeal 8-bit computer. Stay tuned for more 8-bit contents.